Hi, this is Frank, and welcome back to The Next Realignment. In this episode, we are going to be talking about the rise of a new force in American politics in the 1950s, the conservative movement. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the movement that transformed the Republican Party from an ad hoc group of people who agreed about what they didn't want into one united movement with one agenda and ideology about what they did want. It's the movement that took what had been an opposition coalition and an opposition ideology of squabbling factions that often disagreed and united them into a common purpose and a common answer to this era's great debate, the debate that had been raging since the beginning of the New Deal about whether and how to adapt America's institutions to modernity and the complexity of the modern world. And that movement is the conservative movement. The conservative movement was, and it's important to remember this, a legitimate social movement. And probably one of the most important and influential social movements in all of American history. It's a movement that started, as all social movements do, with a group of outsiders, thinkers and intellectuals and writers who got together to develop ideas, ideas about the ways that they didn't like the direction of the country and what was going on in the world, and that they had resolved to change them. And they came up with these ideas, and then they launched them into the world of politics directly. And from there, they went to battle against the institution of the Republican Party and that party's establishment, and then they won that battle. And then through eras of fights and through generations of politicians like Ronald Reagan and Newt Gingrich up until today, they became not just the driving force of the Republican Party, but one of the driving forces of events in America. And yet for some reason, until really merely the last few years, This is a story from American history that hasn't probably gotten its due as a part of American political history and as one of the most important social movements in the history of the United States. And there's some reasons for that. I think in part because it's intellectual history. And we don't like to focus on intellectual history. We like to focus on on the practical history of doers, of, of senators and presidents and presidential administrations, the people who implement ideas. And we don't maybe give the due to the people who develop those ideas. It's also true, though, that we've dismissed the conservative movement a little bit too much because we've had a tendency to view the actors of the early conservative movement, since they were writers, as merely pundits, as people who were just sort of commenting on politics, who were observing the world around them and sort of giving out their opinion, when they were obviously so much more because They weren't just expressing their opinion about what should be done. They became major political actors themselves. Their opinions came to take over a major political party and to change a lot of what was going on in America. So that's what we're going to be talking about today is the conservative movement and how this band of rebels and pirates were able to come together and build themselves into a movement that was able to challenge through the heart of American politics. And it's a story that more than anything else centers around one man. One guy who came up with the idea to get these people together and became their leader and figurehead. And that person, of course, is William F. Buckley Jr. By the 1950s, the intellectual and political right in America was very much in disarray. The old right faction of Senator Bob Taft it was now crumbling and falling apart. The Republican Party, it was now in the hands of the establishment faction of Dewey and Eisenhower and Rockefeller, a faction that believed that the New Deal consensus was now simply the American consensus, that the party had tried challenging the New Deal consensus through the 30s and 40s, and it had gotten killed at the polls. This situation was probably best summed up most famously by the writer Lionel Trilling, who said, In the United States at this time, 
liberalism is not only the dominant, but even the sole intellectual tradition. For it's the plain fact that there are no conservative or reactionary ideas in general circulation. At the same time, in the 1950s, there was still a rising group of new right, of intellectual and thinkers who were sort of dissidents to this New Deal consensus. And some of them operating in the shadows of the general opinion of the United States were starting to gain a little bit of traction. There was famously Russell Kirk, the academic, who in 1953 had published his very influential work, The Conservative Mind. And the goal of The Conservative Mind was to draw out an American conservative intellectual tradition and to tie it to sort of world great figures of thinking and philosophy to demonstrate and to popularize the idea that conservatism was a big part of sort of traditional American thought. There was also the economist, F.A. Hayek. And Hayek in the 1940s had written his very influential book, The Road to Serfdom. And Hayek's book had said essentially that central planning wasn't just inefficient, it was also unjust. And he had proposed essentially that free markets and decentralized systems would be not only more efficient, but more just and fair. And his ideas were starting to gain some traction. There was also the writer Ayn Rand, who had been starting to write in the 1940s, and she had published in the 1940s her book, The Fountainhead. And now she was gaining followers to her libertarian objectivist ideas. And by 1957, she would write Atlas Shrugged. So there were some thinkers and writers and philosophers who were starting to challenge this consensus, but they were still very much considered outsiders and dissidents on the fringe of the majority of American thought. That doesn't mean that there was nobody in America who were active in politics and culture that we would, looking back, consider a conservative, because there certainly were. There was the business community in particular. They were very concerned about taxes and regulations and what was going on in government. There was also the rise of anti-communism, particularly after the rise of Joe McCarthy. And anti-communists were starting to come out and had some problems with the direction of the American government. And we would probably label most of those people now today as conservatives. There was also traditionalists or people who just really had problems with the centralization of power in the government or some of the programs and the direction the New Deal had taken America. But it's important to recognize that these people, they were still not operating as one united group. They might have shared a common enemy, but they often distrusted each other and were more suspicious of each other than they were of the establishment that they were attacking. But then, in 1955, a young man came along, a guy by the name of William Buckley, and he decided that he would found a little political magazine by the name of National Review. And it was his goal that he was going to challenge this national consensus, and that he was going to, with himself and his group of writers, change it and change the direction of America. Or, as he put it in the founding statement of his first issue, he and his magazine would stand athwart history yelling, stop. William F. Buckley is generally remembered as a pundit. He's a guy who wrote about politics. He was a frequent talking head on television. He was the host of his popular television debate program, Firing Line. But in reality, Buckley was also so much more than that. He's actually one of the most significant political figures of the whole 20th century, and quite arguably one of the most significant political figures of all of American history, based on his impact on the direction of the country. He's actually the closest thing to our era's Henry Clay. Henry Clay the guy who had to take a disparate coalition of feuding people who'd been thrown together in a political coalition because they disliked a particular politician and ideology and had to be somehow forged into one united group with its own beliefs and an agenda that could last and keep that coalition together for decades. And he's very different as a person from what a lot of people presume based on his image and sort of his reputation. See, Buckley, he grew up in a wealthy family, but he wasn't an old money aristocrat at all. He was actually Irish Catholic at a time in which that still denoted a little bit of outsider status in America. 
And his father made his money sort of recently in the oil business in Mexico. And so Buckley had grown up with a lot of his youth abroad. He, uh, his first language was Spanish growing up in Mexico. He'd been educated in boarding schools around the world, which is what's credited with giving him that sort of unique transatlantic accent. He wrote novels for fun. He was a musician. And most remarkably, based on sort of how political debate is conducted today, he had a lot of really good friendships with people on the other side of the aisles. Buckley had arisen as an intellectual star in his 20s because he had written a book, a book called God and Man at Yale. At the end of World War II, when he had finished his service in the army, Buckley had enrolled at Yale. And when he graduated after being recruited into the CIA and serving two years, which was sort of not unusual for an Ivy Leaguer of that time and place, Buckley decided that he was going to write a book about his experiences in the institution. And the book was very critical. See, Buckley thought that Yale had turned its back on its traditions and that it had adopted these new ideas of liberalism that it was teaching to its students and that these ideas were a mistake. And the book garnered a lot of attention. And it was viewed as not just a critique about Yale, but it was also a critique about the entire direction of the American establishment. So Buckley was now in his 20s, and he was a big intellectual star. And he has to figure out what he's going to do next. So he's writing and getting involved in politics. He starts considering, well, maybe he should manage or, or maybe even buy one of the existing political magazines, but he decides instead that he should found his own, a magazine that could be the vehicle for his ideas and where he wants to take America. So he finds a partner, a guy by the name of Willie Schlamm. Willie Schlamm is an older, established, respected journalist. He uh, is Austrian communist who had left communism behind in the wake of Stalin and moved himself to the right. And he built a reputation as part of the Time Magazine empire. So Buckley and Schlamm, they start raising money, and they get the money, and they create this magazine that they call National Review. And it wasn't too long before Schlamm was out, and Buckley had assumed sole control and management of the magazine. Buckley collected around himself and recruited to his magazine a strange menagerie of writers and thinkers, people who fiercely disagreed about a lot of different things and about where they wanted to take the country. There were some traditionalist conservatives, people like Russell Kirk, the author of The Conservative Mind. There were also a good number of former communists who had turned their back on their former ideology by the 1950s, most famously Whitaker Chambers of the Alger Hiss Affair. There were also a number of people we would call libertarians, people attracted to the ideas of liberty, the ideas of Hayek or Rand, who liked the use of markets and were concerned about too much government imposition on individuals. And there were also a fair number of religious conservatives, many of them Catholic, people like Buckley's brother-in-law, Brent Bozell. And each of these different groups, looking back, we would probably now all call them different types of conservatives or different factions of conservatives. But that's not how they saw things at all at the time. They saw themselves as completely different factions who were often at each other's throats about where they all wanted to take the country. And the disagreements between them could sometimes get quite, quite harsh. The sort of fight between the traditionalists and the libertarians really kind of came to a head. And at one point, Whitaker Chambers wrote a book review of Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, which was one of the most harsh and brutal book reviews ever published, where he essentially called the book fascist. And Rand, ultimately, she and her followers completely divorced themselves from the entire conservative movement in Buckley's band and saw themselves as completely hostile to that entire endeavor. But it was Buckley's mission to somehow overcome that, to take all of these people that were in an ad hoc coalition and to somehow make them into one united group. And the job of doing that really ended up falling on one guy at National Review, another former communist, a guy by the name of Frank Meyer. Frank Meyer was another interesting character at National Review. 
He was a German communist and Oxford graduate who had moved to America and then turned his back on communism in the wake of Stalin to become a libertarian. And he was sort of an odd character. He never came into the office because he kept nocturnal habits. He would basically sleep throughout the day, and then he would scribble at his kitchen table throughout the night while waking people up making phone calls while they were trying to sleep. But it fell to Meyer to somehow unify all these different thinkers and writers at National Review and in this new movement to unite them as one sort of group, to find a philosophy or an ideology that would convince all these people that they weren't really on different teams. They were all really on the same team. And the idea that he came up with was one that he called fusion conservatism or simply fusionism. Meyer's fusionism rested on sort of two insights, one that built upon the other. The first of these insights is very similar to one that we've been talking about in the series, which was that all the people who objected to the New Deal and New Deal liberalism, at the end of the day, really had two big objections. One of these two big objections. One was that the New Deal liberalism as an idea had, uh, didn't pay sufficient attention to defending individual liberty. And the second one was that New Deal liberalism, in the way that it had changed America and American culture and society, was an undercutting these ideas of the personal virtues that the country needed to survive and thrive. The second insight Meyer had was that these two different ideas, liberty and virtue, weren't even really two big ideas. They were the same idea. To Meyer, liberty and virtue were codependent because liberty needed virtue and virtue needed liberty. In Meyer's mind, a government needed to defend individual liberty if it wanted to see virtues arise in its citizens. But at the same time, you needed a citizenry that had these individual virtues in order to build and maintain a government that defended individual liberty. To Meyer, liberty and virtue weren't two different ideas. They were different parts of the same idea. And that all the libertarians and the traditionalists at National Review that had been squabbling and fighting with each other, they were in fact mistaken and wrong because they weren't different factions with big disagreements that were fighting with each other. They were in fact followers of the same ideology all along. They all believed the same thing. All the different squabbling thinkers at National Review, whether it was the traditionalists or the libertarians or the uh, anti-communists, all of these people, they were in fact not different groups at all. They were different aspects of the same ideological group. They were all fusion conservatives. Meyer's fusionism soon became the in-house philosophy of National Review, and through it, the official philosophy of the conservative movement. And as now the keepers of the in-house philosophy of the conservative movement, it soon fell to the people around National Review to define, well, who was actually in this movement? What did it mean to be a conservative? Who counted and who was on the outside? And what specifically was it that a conservative was supposed to believe? They started making decisions to push out and denounce those that they thought were too disreputable for their movement, the most notable of those being members of the John Birch Society. The John Birch Society was very influential at the time. Uh, it was a very influential conservative organization, but it was also broadly viewed as conspiratorial, somewhat radical, and flirting with the very far right. So the folks at National Review denounced the John Birch Society and pushed them out of their movement. They also tried to push out anti-Semitism from their movement. But they also, in doing this, made some really, really big mistakes. And the most notable of those being their lack of support for the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Buckley himself penning a piece in the National Review that in later life he very much regretted and repeatedly had to apologize for. But by the early 1960s, Buckley and his group at National Review had somehow seemingly accomplished the impossible. This little magazine, founded only in 1955, had now somehow united all of these different groups, had convinced them that they weren't different groups, but they were part of the same ideological faction with a united set of beliefs, beliefs that were now well-defined and 
that didn't just have a vision for what they didn't want, what they wanted to oppose, but also carried a vision of what it was that they affirmatively wanted to do. The conservative movement and Buckley and the National Review started to look around to see how they could get involved in practical politics. How could they take these ideas that they had developed and to start actually implementing them in America? And their focus, it wasn't going to be on older people, not on people and Americans who were stuck still in the 1930s and 1940s, but they were going to look more to young people, particularly these young baby boomers who were now starting to come of age and start getting involved in politics. So in 1960, Buckley invited to his house a bunch of leaders of young Republican organizations. And they all came out to his place in Sharon, Connecticut, where while they were there, he forged them into a new organization, an organization called Young Americans for Freedom. And all these young Republicans that had joined this organization, they all there signed on to a statement, a statement of their commitments and ideological beliefs. It was called the Sharon Statement. And the Sharon Statement, to nobody's surprise, echoed the fusion conservative ideas of National Review and of the conservative movement. But the real prize of politics, of course, was always going to be presidential politics, particularly the next presidential race coming up in 1964. Because if the conservative movement wanted to have influence in politics, they needed to have influence in the Republican Party. And at that point, the Republican establishment was still holding the conservative movement very much at arm's length. They looked at this conservative movement as a bunch of young people who were radicals, they were too strident, they were going to turn people off, and most important, they were trying to take the party back to the failed strategy of the 1930s and the 1940s. So if Buckley and his conservative movement were ever going to have influence within the Republican Party, they were going to need to find a candidate, somebody to represent them and their views in the election of 1964, and to come into the Republican convention and face off against the establishment and finally earn them the seat at the table that they had so far been denied. So they started looking around for a candidate, somebody that they thought would represent them and take their views, these fusion conservative ideas they had developed, and represent them before the Republican Party and before America. But the problem they had was this. They couldn't find one who accurately represented their views, the views of fusion conservatism. And with no ready candidate available, that meant they were going to need to create one. The perfect candidate in the eyes of Buckley and the others in the conservative movement would have been Arizona Senator Barry Goldwater. Barry Goldwater in the 1960 Republican National Convention had given a speech in which he had denounced the Republican establishment and he had demanded that conservatives, quote, take this party back. It had made him sort of a conservative hero. He had also recently published a book called Conscience of a Conservative, setting out the ideas that he had said that he believed. And it was a book that was ghostwritten by none other than William F. Buckley's brother-in-law, Brent Bozell. And the book, to no surprise, drew heavily on the fusion conservative ideas right out of the pages of National Review. So if there was any politician in America who represented the ideas of the conservative movement, it was definitely Barry Goldwater. The problem was Barry Goldwater wasn't planning to run for president. So if the conservative movement wanted Barry Goldwater as a candidate, they had to somehow draw him into a race that he didn't want to run. So what they did was they founded an organization called the Draft Goldwater Committee. Now, it was an organization that was headed by the publisher of National Review, William Rusher, and a political operative by the name of Cliff White. And it grew to be quite a big operation. It had hundreds and hundreds of people, political activists and operatives, and they spread out state by state, and they began working with state party organizations to try to engineer the nomination of Barry Goldwater, all while at National Review, Buckley and the other writers were writing glowing thing after glowing thing about Goldwater. Before long, the nomination looks like it's Goldwater's to take. And with the nomination just available to him, Goldwater reluctantly gets drawn into the race. And he agrees that he's going to run. And the conservative movement, now they have their candidate. 
The story of the 1964 presidential campaign between Barry Goldwater and Lyndon Johnson is one that we're going to be talking about in a lot more detail in future episodes, in both its impact on the Republican Party and its impact on all of American politics. But the thing you really need to understand about it right now is that it was almost entirely the creation of William F. Buckley and his friends at National Review and his conservative movement. Because it was Buckley and his friends at National Review and their conservative movement who had picked Goldwater as a candidate, even though he wasn't even running. They had then inflated a bubble of support for Goldwater. They had then gone out and supplied the ideas that he would come to represent in his campaign. And they had built an organization to engineer and secure for him the Republican nomination. When Goldwater himself got drawn into the race, he would marginalize the draft Goldwater committee, and he would bring in professional campaign advisors, mostly friends and loyalists that he'd known from Arizona. But it was still his campaign was driven by and driven forward by Buckley and his conservative movement. Buckley and his conservative movement had finally taken themselves mainstream. And they had finally earned the seat at the table that they wanted within the Republican Party. They had also finally reopened the debate that had been seemingly closed in 1952. This debate about whether the Republican Party should accommodate itself to the New Deal consensus and accept it as now just the American consensus, or whether they should start to challenge it. Buckley had now energized a bunch of young people and united them into one ideological cause. And by doing that, he had now shifted this momentum of this debate. In prior years, the insurgent conservatives, they had always lost. But now, in 1964, the Republican National Convention, the momentum was with the conservatives. And it was, for that reason, a very bitter and angry convention. It was the convention in which Barry Goldwater had said that extremism in the defense of liberty was no vice, and in which the establishment's candidate, uh, Rockefeller, had actually said that the conservatives and their ideas, quote, had nothing to do with Americanism. Barry Goldwater, of course, went on to lose the election of 1964. And he didn't just lose, he lost badly. It was one of the worst electoral losses in all of American presidential history. It was a loss so bad that everybody in America, the Republican Party and the American people in general, viewed it for years as an epic and terrible mistake. That what had happened as they saw it was a bunch of radicals and crazy people had been allowed to take over one of the parties. They had nominated a crazy, unelectable candidate, and the American people, viewing what they had done, soundly rejected them. So in the aftermath of the election, the Republican establishment was able to take back control of the Republican Party. And everybody, therefore, thought that it was time to just forget about what had happened and move on and make sure that it never, ever happened again. But what nobody yet realized was that the Republican Party that the establishment had taken back control of after 1964 was now a very different party. The conservative movement was now a major political force in America. Just think about everything the conservative movement had now achieved just since the founding of National Review in 1955, which had been barely even a decade in the past. It had united a disparate group of factions around a common ideology and a common set of ideas, that of fusionism. It had blurred the distinctions between these groups and convinced them all that they were part of one united political identity. They were simply conservatives. It had energized a whole bunch of young people and drawn them into politics and where they had been motivated and attached to these new conservative ideas. And it had handpicked its own presidential candidate and delivered him a presidential nomination. And all these young people who had come out for Barry Goldwater, they weren't going anywhere after 1964. They would go on to found organizations and institutions and to fuel countless more political campaigns over decades and decades to come. The 1964 election was also important to the conservative movement 
because it created a whole new generation of political stars. Political stars whose politics centered around the ideas of the conservative movement. The most important of which, of course, was a Hollywood actor. A Hollywood actor who was asked to give a speech on television endorsing Barry Goldwater, a speech that was called A Time for Choosing. And the speech had so captivated America that it had transformed him in their eyes from merely an entertainer into a political figure in his own right. And that actor, of course, was Ronald Reagan. America's debate over the New Deal and the New Deal consensus that had begun in 1932 had now entered a new stage, and just in time, because America was about to turn its back on the pragmatic politics focused mostly on economic questions of the early 20th century to a new type of politics, a politics that was focused more on social and moral questions and questions of social and moral reform, as America was about to plunge into the tumultuous politics of the 1960s and 1970s. Thanks a lot for watching, and if you enjoyed the episode, please give it a like. And make sure you tune into the next episode, because we're about ready to get into the 1960s and 1970s. But before we do, we're going to take a look back at history to talk about the pendulum in American politics back and forth between pragmatic political eras and eras of moral revival and social reform, from the abolition movement and religious revivals and the progressive movement all the way up to today the eras that some people call awakenings.